it's really a pleasure to see all of you uh, and uh, e even on a what if for some of us at least is a snowy tuesday but that shouldn't affect us this way i got an email from alan this morning uh, indicating isn't it good that we're on zoom this way we don't have to worry um about uh about the weather getting in the way in any case um it's really my pleasure our pleasure uh, to be able to offer this book talk with my friends and uh, now emeritus colleague, uh, Alan Middleman, professor of philosophy and Jewish thought here at the Jewish Theological Seminary for a long time, recently retired from active teaching, uh, but a teacher for all of us. And uh, he'll be speaking about uh, primarily his most recent book, though he did indicate to me that in considering this, he's had some uh, second thoughts on some things he wrote in the past. So maybe he'll, he'll get into that as well. Uh, I can't think, Alan, of anybody I would rather learn about absurdity from than you. Um, <laughs> other things as well. I don't mean to narrow it to absurdity, but since your book is Absurdity and Meaning in Contemporary Philosophy and Jewish Thought, um, you know, it seems like an appropriate place to begin, for everybody, uh, let me just set a few ground rules. I will highlight Alan so that you'll all be able to see him well. Please stay on mute. If you stray off of mute, I will find you and remote mute you. Uh, if you have questions, please put them into the chat and Alan can decide whether he wants to take questions at any point in the middle of his presentation or only at the end. Uh, I will gather them and line them up um, to make it for easy feeding to you, Alan, so that you don't have to follow them while we're going along. Uh, and I think that's probably all of the technicalities. The only thing I would add is uh, if Alan is like I am when doing these uh, Zoom presentations, uh, tell me, Alan, do you prefer to see faces above dark screens with names on them? We like to know who we're talking to, right? Get some reaction. So if you're not doing anything that you want to hide behind, then please feel free at least uh, to join us uh, on screen. We would love to see you. Uh, and without any further hesitation, uh, Dr. Middleman, please. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Thank you for the gracious introduction. And it's nice to be back at uh, JTS in a virtual sense. Um, I saw immediately in the chat that there was a question about source uh, materials. There are no source materials. Uh, it's just a talk on uh, this book, which uh, came out in November of last year. Um, what I'd like to talk about uh, is both the book and its contents. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to um, write the book, uh, what its concerns are, and then to try to, uh, in a, a very sketchy form, replicate its argument for you. Uh, the book is called Absurdity and Meaning in Contemporary Philosophy and Jewish Thought. And uh, the somewhat uh, par of title, which uh, I found is the uh, preference of many publishers. So it's very searchable. I originally wanted to call it um, Traces of the Absurd, which I think has a nice ring to it. But who's going to look up Traces of the Absurd? Uh, if you're interested in the meaning of life, you'd put in something like meanings. So, um, but the, the, the title captures uh, now, the way I've been working since about uh, 2005 or so, and that is to um, take my curiosity and my agitation about what the John Templeton Foundation calls the big questions, the big questions, and to think about the big questions of life uh, through uh, 
uh, sort of two uh, frameworks. One is Jewish sources. Uh, I was trained in uh, philosophy of religion and modern Jewish thought, but I feel like I have an amateur license to range over the whole, you know, Jewish uh, corpus. Um, uh, of course, when uh, it matters, I turn to experts like Professor Kramer, um, uh, who do the, uh, the really detailed, uh, serious work on the primary sources. But I range over the Jewish canon, so to speak, and I also range over the Western philosophical tradition. Uh, this book uh, really zooms in on uh, contemporary philosophy. And uh, although I have some references to um, Pamu, for example, uh, I'm really focused on the, uh, the Anglo-American so-called analytic tradition in uh, uh, modern philosophy. So I use uh, philosophy to help sharpen and frame uh, the questions, the modes of inquiry, to kind of establish the stakes of the inquiry. And I use, uh, I use philosophy as well to uh, give me a, a window on what's at stake in the Jewish sources. But I use the Jewish sources to push back on the philosophy. Uh, I think philosophy, of course, comes with its own limits, its own historical uh, habits. And uh, sometimes uh, its way of doing things, to me, is insufficiently deep uh, or capacious. And I find being immersed in Jewish outlooks can correct deficits in philosophy. The point of this book was to look at the um, discussion in Anglo-American philosophy over the past uh, 75 years or so on the meaning of life and to try to use the rigor of the philosophical discussion to interrogate the Jewish sources, but to then use the Jewish sources, as I mentioned, to sort of enrich philosophical treatments. Well, why do this? Because uh, I want to bring about a conversation uh, between these two uh, sometimes, I would say, needlessly opposed traditions, modern philosophy in the analytic tradition and Jewish thought. I want to bring about a conversation, even if I'm only having a conversation with myself, at least to invite the reader uh, into it. Um, okay, so since I started working on this, the research of this book around 2017, and people, you know, would ask me, well, what are you working on now? And I kind of take a deep breath and say, well, a book about the meaning of life. And of course you get arched eyebrows and the incredulous stare when you say such a thing. It sounds you know, infinitely pretentious or portentous or it's kind of dumb in a way. <laughs> so I would hasten to say, you know, I'm not going to tell anyone the meaning of life. What I'm exploring is questions about the question of what is the meaning of life. That is, I want to know what kind of question is this? Why do we ask this? Is this an answerable question? What possible answers are there? I want to get a kind of conceptual uh, analysis of the very activity of inquiry into the meaning of life. Um, and I want to I want to bring that refinement to the the Jewish sources. Let me say uh, right off the bat that the question of the meaning of life is a disfavored question in contemporary philosophy. Uh, for a long time, philosophers thought that this was a meaningless question. Uh, it has the logical grammatical form of a properly formulated English language question. 
what is the meaning of life, but there's something off about it. They might say it's similar to the question, is red faster than green? That is, okay, it's a well-formulated question grammatically, but doesn't mean anything. Red and green are not the kinds of things that can be fast. So a question about which is faster is nonsense. Similarly, philosophers for <clears throat> the early part of the 20th century would say, uh, words have meaning, sentences have meaning, poems have meaning, works of music and art have meaning, lives do not have meaning. A life in its totality is not the kind of thing that can have a meaning. It's a nonsense question. In the second half of the 20th century, I would say people backed off uh, from that very severe assessment and they started thinking that because it's a kind of ineluctable question, we can't help but ask something like that. We shouldn't just say people are idiots and they're engaged in nonsensical questioning. We should try to see what's behind such a question and see how we can salvage it. So I think the picture that emerges from 20th century philosophy uh, on the whole is that the question, what is the meaning of life, is still not quite kosher. The fallback question, how do we find meaning in life? In what ways can life be meaningful? Things like that, a shift from of life to in life. Well, what's the difference? Of life sounds very... Uh, top down, one size fits all, very prescriptive, very out of sync with um, a democratic age where people are entitled to shape their own meaning in their own lives. Uh, it's very much uh, a kind of religious question, not, I would argue that a religion, particularly Judaism has a single answer or anything of that sort, but there's still a discomfort with the question meaning of life. So when you look around in this literature, which there are dozens of books, hundreds of articles, some quite technical, it's a whole subfield of philosophy. The, uh, the phrase is generally meaning in life rather than meaning of life. Um, the whether we say meaning of life or meaning in life uh, is very much a modern question. Nobody before the 19th century asked the question, what is the meaning of life? How can I say that? That sounds idiotic. Um, ancient people, say the Greeks, were interested in what is the best life. What is the, the so-called flourishing or the eudaimonistic life? What is a happy life? An ancient Israelite might be concerned about what a holy life is. What is a good life? Uh, all of these are the, the real classic Greek question. The good life is the life according to nature. So what is such a life like? I mean, there's a great deal of argument among the ancient Greeks about what a life according to nature is. The cynics uh, got their name from the Greek word for dog. They believed the life according to nature was like being naked and uncivilized. Hence, they were referred to as, by their opponents as dogs. That's very natural life, but maybe not for human beings. Uh, but the idea that life has a meaning, that that's the right question to ask, that's actually a very, a very modern development. And so, it's not only a kind of radical, secularist, post-death of God philosophers who don't like the meaning question because it sounds too religious. It's also very traditional religious people who find the question too modern. And I, I lay out that whole history in my book. So the term meaning of life goes back to the German romantics in the town of Jena. Uh, in the former East Germany. Uh, it comes into English through the translation of some German poetry and novels in the early 19th century. 
it's interesting that um, the phrase uh, meaning of life is in des Lebens, I'll throw that in for you, Sammy, uh, comes up in a critique of the so-called Sinn des Lebens or meaning of life by someone who accuses uh, the seekers of meaning in life of being nihilists. So nihilismus, nihilism, a term which has a, a big role in my book, as I'll explain, uh, is born at the same time as the concept of meaning in life. Uh, the reason that the romantics, these German philosophers and, and poets um, start talking about the meaning of life is because they're living at a time when enlightenment rationalism has kind of robbed nature of its enchantment, of its spirituality, of its status as creation as a place infused with the divine will. Nature becomes flat, so-called disenchanted. Uh, and the romantics protest against the overreach of reason in making nature solely scientific, mathematical, and they liken nature to a book with hidden meanings that only the artist, the person in touch with emotion and inspiration and who's a creator like God, uh, the artist is the one who can read the Zin des Lebens, the meaning of life, and restore to nature this richness and spiritual depth that it had in pre-modern, pre-enlightenment times. So that's where the, the phrase comes in. Um, it seems to me that there are basically two um, hostile positions that post-romantic moderns take toward the meaning of, uh, of life uh, or even in life. One is a conservative response. And I, I came across this early on in my research and I was fascinated by it. If you're a conservative Catholic philosopher, and you're working within the natural law tradition, you got no time for the meaning of life. Do you think that that is uh, an offensive modern idea that's self undermining? Uh, what the conservative uh, Catholics whom I, I study in the book have to say is that nature is, is God's creation. God imbues nature with a law, the so-called natural law, which is kind of reason, and nature is full of inherent goods that support uh, human life. And we can uh, sense these goods with our God-given reason. Friendship is a good, knowledge is a good, marriage, only one kind of marriage, of course, is a good, um, virtues are goods. And the life that human beings are meant to live is the life according to nature. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of repository of goods. And this is ultimately a life of knowing, worshiping, serving, loving God. This is what human beings are for. Human beings have a purpose. They can understand their purpose through divine revelation, but they can understand their purpose in a purely rational mode through rational reflection on nature. To ask the question then of the meaning of life is to turn away from the human purpose on Catholicism, a traditional Catholicism anyway. And uh, therefore the meaning of life is a question uh, destined to fail because once you give up on the objectivity of human purpose, you throw yourself onto the oceans of subjectivity. Everybody gets to pick his or her own meaning of life. Somebody thinks the right meaning of life is to serve humanity in a radically self-sacrificial way, like Mother Teresa. Somebody else thinks that the meaning of life is to have as much pleasure as possible from TV and video games. Who's to say without objective purpose? So that's a sort of conservative critique. 
The other critique from the secular, uh, uh, the secularist uh, uh, atheistic stance is that the meaning of life is a nonsense question, as I suggested earlier, that is meant to be a substitute uh, for the God-given purpose to life. And there is no answer to the question. Uh, once you give up, you know, as a Nietzsche would say, for example, uh, on the God of the Bible and of biblical morality, you give up on all of the habits that come with that. You shouldn't be burdened by them. And asking the question, what is meaning in life? What is the meaning of life? Is a sort of theistic hangover that we, we can afford to abandon. And we should just, um, you know, just admit that there is no point to life. There is no meaning to life in any large sense. You can find your own small purposes, your own delights, the things that you care about. Uh, but uh, there's no generic answer for uh, for, for everybody. Um, so my sense is that um, the late 20th century philosophers, although they, they dial back from meaning of life to meaning in life, uh, reject that uh, earlier 20th century kind of so-called positivist line of, uh, of argument. And they take meaning seriously. So what is meaning on a contemporary philosophical point of view? Uh, and I think this is a sort of important thing to think about because it's, you know, it's kind of easy for us to say Judaism is a meaningful way of life. My life would be meaningless unless I had, you know, my Jewish commitments and convictions and observance and, and so on. But we don't really reflect on what we mean by meaning. How does meaning apply uh, to life? Why is it not just a property of uh, texts and art objects and things like that. So I want to say a little bit uh, about something, a little something about how I define meaning. And then uh, given my um, definition, I want to get into the problem of uh, absurdity, nihilism, uh, and Judaism. Um, so one uh, one way of construing uh, meaning is to say, what's the point? What uh, does, to say what something means is to say what its purpose is. Uh, when the late uh, Nobel, uh, f f uh, physics Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg said the more we understand about the universe, the more pointless it seems. He was saying that there's no point to the universe, it just is. Um, and consequently, uh, the manifestations of the universe, its modes, so to speak, its expressions in uh, terrestrial biology like acorns and squirrels and human beings lack any point as well. Ultimately, there's no point, there's no purpose. It's very much a kind of death of God point of view. Um, so I think clearly there's, there's something to this way of thinking about meaning that has to do with purpose, but I doubt that's the whole, the whole thing. And I think, in fact, we find uh, great occasions of meaning in life that are quite non-purposive. That is, when we get out of the purposes that we've set for ourselves, making a living, having a career, raising a family, all of those things that can be replete with meaning. But uh, when we sort of bracket purpose and have contemplative experiences, flow states, aesthetic experiences, things that are inherently non-purposive. If our purpose was to achieve them, we couldn't. 
Uh, these can, can be very, very meaningful moments. Um, so I, I would dissent from the idea that meaning is equivalent to point is equivalent to purpose. Um, I, I'm suggesting we shouldn't use meaning casually and just sort of assume that something like purpose or point is what it means. Um, uh, another view uh, is that meaning is well-functioning. That is, when you're, you've, you've sort of achieved uh, your career goals, your life goals, or in a good relationship, are living in a reasonably decent society, when you have all of those uh, components of human flourishing, uh, you've achieved a meaningful life. I don't think this is true. Uh, I think that uh, so-called human flourishing, an Aristotelian concept, uh, is not equivalent to, um, uh, to meaning. Uh, I think if you uh, read uh, an early modern utopia, uh, Francis Bacon's Atlantis, uh, it's a great place. I mean, who wouldn't want to live in Atlantis? Everybody's a scientist, everybody's productive and wise, and they have this really nice, sort of totally liberal, kind of rational, vaguely Christian religion. It just can't get any better than this. I can imagine the denizens of Atlantis saying, man, is this all there is? Yeah. And wealthy, and we're creating the next generation of people to be happy and wise and wealthy. Ad infinitum, so what? You know, what's what's the overall meaning of this? So I don't think that's either. That's it either. Uh, there are other suggestions, but not a lot of time. So I want to tell you what I think meaning is. Um, I think meaning is uh, constituted by two two things importance and intelligibility, or significance and intelligibility. I think something is meaningful to us, even ourselves, our mattering to ourselves, our mattering enough to matter to others, because our lives have significance, because what we care about has significance, has importance. It stands out from things that are indifferent, that don't have importance. And I think it has a certain shape, and its shape is that of intelligibility. Things matter, things have significance or importance because of what they reveal, because of what we can credibly say about them. So importance or significance and intelligibility uh, are for me the main components of meaningfulness. And therefore, to give you a definition, I would say meaning is a response to values, to values that we discover in our lives or to the valued aspects of our experience. Things you might remember, like a first kiss, like some other wonderful significant event in your life. Um, those are not in and of themselves value, but they are something that reveals value. So meaning uh, is a response to value that fixes its significance. And what I mean by that is that to reflect on an experience, an event, an object, a poem, uh, a span of your life, a job from which you were just fired, a job uh, for which uh, you're just hired and it's your dream job. To think about that under the aspect of significance and intelligibility is to locate its, its meaning. And we are constantly in the midst of seeking meaning in life, which is to say, integrating our values, our experiences, our beliefs, our memories, our hopes for the future into stories, into narrative ways of making sense of value. So I say meaning is that which fixes the significance of value. When I was writing the book, uh, we were in the mid middle of the pandemic. 
And you recall there was a gigantic, uh, ugly fight going on in the society that pitted individual liberty against public health and well-being, masks, um, as a crisis. Uh, so um, for some people, individual liberty is absolutely the highest value, and it trumps, no pun intended, everything else. And for other people, uh, some sort of social solidarity, mutuality, care for the other is the important value. You come down in different places. So here we have a clash of values. How can we relate to them meaningfully? I think we tried to make sense of them by looking at um, stories that our ancestors have told uh, about in the, in the American context about how values can be reconciled or adjudicated or related to one another. So stories are those meaningful ways of um, fixing the significance and responding to the importance of value. That to me is the, the sort of um, way of uh, approaching meaning. So given this definition, we're constantly in the midst of meaning. We're tr constantly trying to find intelligibility and significance in our lives. But we're also constantly in the midst of a deeper level of questioning as to why the things that matter to us matter. What is it that makes things worthy of mattering? Um, we are in the midst uh, constantly of a so-called life world, what the German philosopher mid uh, early uh, 20th century Husserl calls the Lebenswelt, the life world. And within our experience of life in a society, in a culture, in a religious tradition with one another at a given time, we have resources to talk about meaning, to talk about value and significance. Uh, we have practical, emotional, and relational uh, capacities and ways of rendering them intelligible and finding uh, their importance. But sometimes we slip out of the life world. It, uh, to use a literary term, it, it's defamiliarized. It uh, becomes strange to us. And we wonder, why are the things I've cared about worth caring about? Maybe they're not worth caring about. Tolstoy wrote, uh, important works on this question is a uh, novella, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, is about uh, a man who develops a fatal disease in the prime of life. He was happy in a way, successful, smug, uh, secure. People liked him. His world was intact. As he got sicker and sicker and the illusions fell away, that he wasn't going to get better, people abandoned him. And he was uh, really at a very extreme point where he determined that everything that had mattered to him in his life, all of those indicia of success and contentment, uh, were, not, were not worth having cared about. There was a kind of lie to them. He comes to the same conclusion in his autobiography, The Confessions, uh, to the brink of suicide. And Tolstoy reconstructs in a Christian way the meaning that saves him from suicide and saves Ivan Ilyich, the fictional character, uh, at a kind of redemptive moment, like a nanosecond before he, he dies. Um, so I'm interested in how the workaday meanings that we have in our life world or that we inherit as part of our religious traditions, get shaky and what our resources are for living with the shakiness or repairing the shakiness of those, of those values. So that draws me in the introduction to the book to an ancient Jewish text. And the text is Kohelet the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, does not ask the question of meaning because 
it's a modern question. But Ecclesiastes basically gives us an account of a life. The conceit is that Solomon is the author in the eyes of the tradition. The book just talks about being king in Jerusalem. Uh, but the tradition reads that as Solomon, who's wise, and this is a, a book of wisdom, but it's also a book that opens up a kind of absurdity. And my claim is that this ancient text um, introduces a theme of absurdity that lingers in Judaism down to the present day. And I'll, I'll tell you in a, in, a, in a moment what I mean by absurdity, but just to reacquaint you with the book, um, the, the author, I'm just going to call him Kohelet, uh, begins with the, the declaration of a discovery. And the discovery is that absolutely everything is futile, fleeting, unimportant, disappointing. It is hevel. Hevel means something like breath, and it means the kind of breath you can see on a winter's day, which has a sort of gaseous substantiality for a moment, and then it's gone. That is life. That is the world. That is all of our activity in the world, what we've accomplished. And he begins the book by asking the question, Ma yitron, what is the worth? What, if anything, is the enduring value, b'chol amalo, of all of a human being's labor, his struggle, his effort under the heavens. Um, and it's it, the book is basically an, an essay into what a king accomplished, what a king acquired, what a king thought was important, and how the king became disillusioned with all of it. Does it have a firm, redemptive conclusion as it wrestles in a, a remarkably philosophical way with this. No, it doesn't. As I read it, there's no definitive resolution to this problem of what is anything worth? Why should anything matter? What's significant and important about life? I don't think it does. Um, what, the, what the writer comes back to is a qualified acceptance of the things he had previously rejected. He first endorsed things like pleasure, companionship, wealth, productive activity, wisdom. Then he becomes disenchanted with all of that. Wisdom least of all, but he thinks that wisdom is self-undermining. So yeah, he's disenchanted with that too. But at the end, he kind of comes around to saying, this is it. This is the human lot. This is the best we can do, and it's not bad. So let us affirm these things, but let us also be very conscious of how transient uh, they are and of how uh, evanescent, how, how quickly human life evaporates, leaving not a trace. This is a kind of absurdist conclusion. What I mean by absurdity is a state, a, a judgment on the nature of the world which one achieves by zooming out of the life world and looking at, at it as if from the point of view of the universe, in which we're just so many ants, in a sense. Uh, when you zoom out, when you take the Steven Weinberg point of view, the more we understand about the universe, the more pointless it seems. That is, when you associate yourself with a mythical point of view of the universe, which I think is what's, what's going on, a kind of cosmic view from nowhere perspective that Ecclesiastes acquires, everything is defamiliarized. Everything seems suddenly valueless and unimportant. But you can't live there. You have to come back to the life world where we live. But coming back to the life world, you know that there's a certain truth in what you've seen from afar. So what I take as the meaning of absurdity is a skepticism about value, significance, importance, uh, a skepticism that you can't quite shake, even though you have to bracket it in order to live. 
And it's your very uh, uh, commitment to a, living within a tradition and taking on a point of view that generates the absurdity. Absurdity, in my view, is different from nihilism. Nihilism is a doctrinaire response to absurdity. I think Kohelet responds to absurdity in a creative, fertile, vitalizing, ethical way. And I think the rabbis who interpret Kohelet do that too. I think Judaism does that. But I think what um, the nihilist does, and nihilism is my, my target, it's my opponent in the book. Uh, what the nihilist does is take a very dogmatic point of view that nothing matters, that life is meaningless, full stop, get on with it, grow up, deal with it, expect nothing. I think this is something you can't live with and that nihilists per, per force become hypocritical at best and violent at worst. Um, so where I come down is to try to trace the um, sort of lingering resonance of an absurdist point of view in Judaism. And I do that through a close examination of Jewish philosophical and contemporary scholarly response creation, revelation, and redemption. And I show that deep down, whether it's through a traditional Lurianic Kabbalah, let's say in the case of creation or Genesis Rabbah, the world being built out of very flawed materials like tohu bavohu, where you come down in each place is a kind of sense of the absurd, that there's an ineliminable perplexity about whether creation, revelation, redemption can be as, as clear as coherent, uh, as justified uh, a set of beliefs as we want them to be. Nonetheless, we're committed to them. So there's a tension between our intellectual suspicions, where our conceptual resources can take us until they hit walls of perplexity. There's a tension between that and the existential commitments that we make to live in a certain way. And that is the sense of the absurd. And I wanna keep that sense of the absurd alive in Judaism. And I wanna juxtapose it to nihilism uh, and uh, show that it is uh, on rational grounds and practical grounds, uh, far superior to nihilism. Uh, I also want to show that philosophy, the other sort of half of the, the text that I study, uh, philosophy also runs into ineliminable perplexity. For example, there's um, an unsettled argument between whether meaning is subjective or objective. One of the great philosophers of our time, who just died last year, Harry Frankfurt, he's a subjectivist. He thinks that that which has value, that which is worth caring about, that which matters, um, is there only because we have endowed it with value. We have decided it's worth caring about in an otherwise flat and uh, mute universe. So life is alive with value, but it's because we put it there and it's subjectively dependent. So people can quite differ about what's important to them. So in the Mother Teresa versus addictive gamer case, there's no way of adjudicating who has the more meaningful life. They both have a meaningful life if meaning is subjective. Another philosopher of, uh, uh, of uh, Susan Wolf at the University of North Carolina, she's an objectivist. She thinks that our sense of value is a response to value that is already out in the world. And it's our job to get it right. Um, and so there, there are better and worse construals, meaningful stories about what kind of life we should lead, given the value that's out in the world. 
So how can you adjudicate between those two positions? I don't think you can, unless you step out from both of them and say, no, you're both wrong. Uh, this is all uh, meaningless. Uh, as another one of my philosophers uh, uh, goes for. So anyway, uh, I haven't quite gotten to the, the, the down in the weeds part of the book, which is the reading of Jewish texts. I've sort of gone begadol here and given you a big picture. Um, where do I come down if you were to ask me, well, Alan, what's the meaning of life? Well, first I'd say, Gewalt, I can't tell you what the meaning of life is, but then I'd say, here's my best candidate answer. I think the, uh, the argument that we have to make is that the Kohelet-type perception or the, um, the uh, Steven Weinberg-type perception, the so-called view from outside the life world, the, the human pretension to objectivity, to a universal uh, point of view, uh, that does have a certain authority. Uh, it's not to say we're always right when we assume such a point of view, far from it, we're mostly wrong. But the aspiration to objectivity has a certain compelling quality and an objectivity to it. We have to honor that. But I think our mistake as moderns is in letting that run amok, uh, in granting that a monopoly on authority. So I think we need to do much more epistemologically and metaphysically to restore perspectives from within the life world. Uh, I think it's entirely wrong to judge, as the nihilist does, that from an extra-human point of view, so to speak, life just is meaningless. That's a fact. The universe is, is a blank, meaningless, pointless cosmos. All human value is projected onto it. Grow up, understand that um, the nihilist view that life just is uh, meaningless, uh, worthless in a sense. We project worth, but in the end, the early uh, Ecclesiastes gets it right. Uh, I think that's a deeply flawed position because I don't think the nihilist who's very confident in making those claims can actually know that. I think there's no scientific or metaphysical point of view that we can uh, assume that doesn't presuppose value. The very claim to knowledge is a value claim. Truth is a value claim. There are epistemic values, we call them, that attend our statements about uh, from a scientific point of view. I think that undermines nihilism. Um, okay, so perhaps I've said enough at this point. We have about 10 minutes left, and there seem to be four questions in the queue. Yeah, why don't you take a look at those? They're actually, I think, more than anything else, observations, but um, certainly invite your response. What is the role of the transcendent in this? That looks like the, um, the most uh, religiously oriented question I can get hold of here. So um, that's a good question. Excuse me, Professor. Um, I don't necessarily mean transcendent only in a religious sense, if, if I understand it correctly. Transcendent also meaning in a Kantian way, maybe something that transcends subjectivity and is something in the sense metaphysical, but not necessarily religious in the classical sense. I'm going to answer it as if you meant transcendent in a religious sense. Then I'm going to double back and address it more broadly. Um, I think the, the standard story about the meaning in life uh, uh, concerns of modern people uh, is that these are so-called post-death of God concerns, that when you had religious civilizations that were robust and all-encompassing and protected human beings under their umbrellas, uh, people didn't ask these 
fraught questions about what am I doing here? What is life for? What does it all mean? You know, they had answers. Um, I don't think that's true. I mean, it might be true in some ways, but part of my going to Kohelet is not just to try to ground these insights in Judaism, but to say, okay, here's a, we don't know when the book was written, but you know, it's at least a few centuries BCE. Um, but here's someone who lives in a totally theistic culture, right? <laughs> who uh, is asking these very fraught questions. He didn't have to live through the enlightenment and, you know, pick up Nietzsche at this corner bookstore to, you know, worry about nihilism and absurdity and so on. Um, so I think it comes down really to what kind of transcendence we're talking about. The God of Kohelet is not a God of personal providence. He's not a Lord of history. He's kind of um, very remote, sort of unsettling, not movable, not a being you can appeal to, kind of karma machine. Uh, so given a certain notion of what's ultimate, of what's metaphysically transcendent, you could still have tremendous perplexity about uh, meaning of life and tremendous anxiety about meaninglessness uh, in life. Um, so I don't see the meaning of life thing, even though it, it does come at a certain moment, at least with its you know, formal concept of meaning. Uh, I don't see this as, a, as only a modern preoccupation. Um, I think transcendence <clears throat> is in a sense what drives one of the drivers of the inquiry, inquiry of my book, because uh, creation, the first thing I consider is really the question of does nature and a sympathetic reading of, of nature or an insightful reading of nature give us the resources we need to live meaningful lives. And the um, if the answer is no, then we have to transcend nature. We have to say, as one book puts it in its title, nature is not enough. Uh, and I think the answer is no, nature is not enough. So there's a a presence of a, an inkling of that which transcends nature <clears throat> that's moving us from um, uh, a naturalistic construal of meaning of life uh, to another level, which is revelation. I'm going to greatly problematize revelation, so that's not a deus ex machina. That's not going to pull meaning out of a, out of a hat. But when you look at some of the people on the philosophy side who wrote uh, books in the past couple of decades on meaning of life, people like the late, um, not a philosopher, but great Harvard biologist, E.O. Wilson, he wrote a book called The Meaning of Life. Um, or this guy, Paul Thagard, who's a, a neuroscientifically oriented philosopher. He basically says, human brains are designed by natural selection to need uh, you know, love, work, uh, and a few other goods. Therefore, live a life in such a way that maximizes love, work, and some other goods. That's a meaningful life. Uh, I don't think that's, that's any kind of answer. Uh, it's, it's certainly possible to have a life that, uh, you know, has a, uh, I mean, it's it, it it's not an answer because it doesn't recognize that there is a, a something of a gap between value and uh, and nature. Nature is a world of facts. Value is something else. So there's a transcendent step that we have to take. So I'm uh, I don't like the naturalistic answers. Somebody has a good. Um, uh, comment here, is it not possible for both views to be true, that there is indeed no meaning in terms of point or purpose to life and its existence, and at the same time we humans can and do find meaning in terms of significance to our life experiences, and that this coexistence 
can be extant with or without the existence of a god or gods. This has worked well for me. Um, it, that, that can work well if you insulate yourself from a slippery slope of asking why questions. I spent last weekend with my three-year-old granddaughter. There are a lot of why questions. You give her, you know, an answer you think is pretty adequate under the circumstances, but it's not adequate enough. She wants a deeper ground for it, let's say. Part of what absurdity is, is the sense that um, there's no ultimate justification. What there is is a decision to stay with us with uh, with certain commitments, with a way of life, with certain beliefs. But if you keep pushing into why, 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 um, your reasons may not run out, but your patience will run out. And therefore, wherever we stop in a search for justification for our values is in some sense arbitrary, which is to say irrational. So I, I think this idea that both views can be true. Um, okay. um, Alan, um, for what it's worth, <laughs> I'm going to uh, arbitrarily say that we've come to the end of our time. Why? Okay. Why? Yeah. Because we've always said that <laughs> approaching an hour would be the end of the time we would devote. I um, really appreciate your... Um, the, th I mean, the thoughtfulness that you shared with us is the thoughtfulness that you see reflected in the comments uh, in, in their variety. And it's clear that people have been stimulated to ask themselves and reflect on the questions uh, that you raise. Uh, I hope it's fair to say that we all look forward, those of us who have not yet read your book, to doing so. Uh, do you have any preference for where people buy your book or anywhere oh. they can get books? Yeah, it's too expensive. I'm sorry, but I had nothing to do with the price point. But I hope the JTS library orders it or has ordered absolutely. it. Absolutely, absolutely. No doubt about it. Get. And you folks, um, it, it's $110, way too much. It is a hardcover with nice cover art, however. Uh, but maybe go to your local library and put in a request for interlibrary loan or that they purchase it. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't give up on the price so quickly. There are many people who are listening are more than willing to spend that amount for a single dinner, or for a night out at a concert or uh, a performance. So I imagine your book will last a heck of a lot longer and can be reread infinite numbers of times for the same price. Yeah, it's meant to be readable. It it deals with, I'd say, deep and serious things, but in a you know I I think a clear and accessible way. It's not technical. I don't use jargon. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. And it really is our privilege to be able to provide you this opportunity to speak about your book and um, for us all to think seriously about the very persistent human questions that you raise. So thank you, everybody. Um, let me just, uh, you know, see the whole screen again and invite you to come back for future library sponsored book talks. Uh, we really do love uh, having these events, and we hope that you appreciate them as much as we do. So bye-bye. Thanks very much. Sure. Bye.